and welcome back to Fox Popcast, the weekly pseudo academic roundtable of pop culture analysis with drinking and swearing. My name is Christopher Maverick, but you can call me Mav, and I am I'm not here with all the co- co-hosts because we added a new co-host, so there's five of us now, and then the new co-host isn't here this week, so returning are well, Wayne's here, and then Katya's here, and then returning to the show we have Hannah. Hey Hannah, <laughs> and everybody hey, else. Hey, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> So this is what happens when you're gone. You just you you stay away, and absence really does make the heart grow fonder. Um, um, we always and, and, miss you. And, and makes the box office numbers go up. Oh yeah, uh, I haven't looked at the exa- I haven't it's, looked at the. It's going updates, well for me. Going, yeah, I think so. You are still in the lead, but like, it's, yes. it's close. And that's as we as we record because Black Widow numbers aren't out, but they're probably really good. And Wayne was being very competitive last night. Right, right now, uh, it's me, then Katya, then Wayne, then you. But you and Wayne are separated by two million dollars. Right. Uh, yeah. So I guess yeah, we'll I, see I, how. I, I, yeah, I had a lot of tragedy in my choices in the first half of the year. So, um, mm-hmm. and that tragedy in some ways will continue because yeah, um, a lot of the movies <laughs> got bumped. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So basically, basically, Wayne picked all the movies that are getting split between <laughs> Disney Plus and theaters, but also, but some of them also just like Luca got sent like directly to Disney Plus and also all the movies that studios were like, but what if we didn't film this yet? Or, and, or <laughs> what if we moved it to 2022 because an actor starring in this had a major mm-hmm. scandal? Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> so but he's got Black Widow. He's got Black Widow now and those results are not in, but like, I would imagine Black Widow is going to have a good weekend. Like, I would imagine uh, that. I would it's assume. going to shatter COVID records, um, right. according to right. Box Office right. Mojo. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. which, what that means. Which, well, it, it conceivably means, I don't think he can pass Hannah this week, but I, he could conceivably catch up to Katya, right? I, I don't know. It's, don't it's know. getting, there's, the point is, there are interesting box office results happening. Um, check our website for, for details, but, you know, we'll, we'll probably be talking about this more because unlike last year, there's sort of a game happening. We've we're we're real, we're real close to actually blowing away what everybody made jointly last year. Last year, right? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> and and Downton Abbey too, which none of us picked, did get moved to 2022. So so now you can. Yeah. So now we now, now we can, can next year. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, is that what we're talking about this week? Downton Abbey too. Not what we're talking about this week. <laughs> Uh, in a way, I guess technically um, it could fit in that it's part of a in, in, series. In, yes. Right. So we are talking about um, adding uh, dehydrated marshmallows to different kinds of media. We are talking about serialization. <laughs> oh, wow. That was. Um... Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I make dumb jokes. So, so what is serialization? T- t- tune in next week and find out. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent question, Anna. Uh, I mean, in its most simple terms, serialization is basically taking a narrative and breaking it down into parts and then releasing them over time. Like when you think of a book series, comic books, you know, different franchise series, it's just basically like you know, the story continues across multiple volumes of something. Mm -hmm. Um, And the reason we wanted to talk about this, and we were actually, I actually went through our archive because I was like, how have we not talked about this? Because literally all of our fields and all of our interests (laughs) are impacted by serialization. (laughs) Like some more than others, but like serialization ends up being like a really important, um, especially relatively modern like technology format um, to how we consume media. I would say like at this point, Mm -hmm. most, well, maybe not most, a significant amount of the media that we consume is in some way in a serialized form, Um, Mm -hmm. especially now that, you know, we have basically like things like the Marvel universe and a lot of other stuff where it's like basically everything continues forever. In 2021, it's a really good way to just, you know, can make it make a long term revenue stream by just making. And now there's a part two and a part three and a part nine and a part 47. You know, you can just it makes sense. Yeah. So basically today we want to talk a little bit about sort of what is serialization? Why do we care about it? And why is it useful to talk about? But I think before we get into that, I do want to talk a little bit about like where serialization comes from, because mm-hmm. serialized narratives you know, I think that there's, we've always had, you know, we've had stories that happen in multiple parts. When you think of like Greek mythology, for example, like 
that's not just one story. That's many interconnected stories, but it's not really a serial. So I know that Hannah probably knows more than I do about the history and the origins of serialization, especially in the more recent past. So Hannah, can you tell us? about the wonderful good things okay but i so i'm going to begin this by quoting a book called serializing fiction in the victorian press and like the first word of the first chapter is uh well the first sentence of the first chapter is serial fiction was not a victorian invention which Mm -hmm. makes me laugh because i i think that uh for i mean i i you know got my degree in victorian studies or at least 19th century studies and the serial novel was very important to the victorian um, but you know, like serialization dates back further, um, and it, you know things were pr- like printed across multiple parts in periodical publications, and you know there were there were early novels that were serialized, and but like we, we tend to think about serialization um, partially because of the bias in my field, and and partially because um, you know Dickens went Dickens um, for example was such a master um, of the serialized novel like in the Victorian period, and so there were these you know novels being printed in multiple parts like being issued in like multiple issues like uh, Little Dort which I mentioned on the blog which you can find at uh, voxpopcast.com where you can leave us comments and see what we're going to be talking about next which I'm sure will involve Dickens at some point again uh, you know Dickens like published Little Dort in serial format uh, before later combining it into like one huge novel that was like published across two years and you know um, for those of you who haven't gone to uh, the Victorian archives um, in your life library uh, you know does. just think yeah as one does as as some of us did and feel felt like we were going to <laughs> disney world um you just you know walk into a comic book store and you see the individual issues of something like miss marvel that that is in some ways like what was going on uh with little dorrit um on the other hand um people would publish different serialized novels alongside other kind of bodies of work like nonfiction essays in mm-hmm. periodicals um and publications like household words uh that's where our tale two cities was published in parts alongside other works and it's really cool to just see how like all these like big name books were published alongside each other and and broken up and uh you know it's like they're there cliffhangers at certain points because they know that you Mm -hmm. have to wait until like the next issue to see what happens so um you know it's like you're watching you know gossip girl on the cw and something shocking happens in fade to black and you have to watch wait till next week um and then there's you know um the the problem with serialization um which is not everything is always written before it's published it depends on the author and the publication and uh willingness to support the work. So actually, uh, mm-hmm. Charles Dickens' last novel um, did not get completed and uh, Edwin Drood just like ends, right? Like you, no one really knows the end of Edwin Drood in the same way that you know, there are a lot of TV shows that have gotten canceled over the years and people are like, why did I invest my time in this? Mm-hmm. It got canceled. That's not fair. Um, mm-hmm. So, so uh, you know, I, <laughs> I, I'm i talking a lot about the novel, but also bringing in contemporary examples because, you know, we, we had you know we had the victorian novel um but then you know there were radio serials and the early tv serials and comic books and you know like heavily serialized television and what i mean by that is just not something that's episodic that makes up part of a show but something that's like lost where each episode built on the other and you just could not like tune in randomly to Lost, Uh like you could to like i love lucy or something So, mm-hmm. uh, so, so soap I would say yeah. all, even before yeah. that, all soap operas. Yeah, also yeah, tele- yeah. daytime soaps and, and, and they grew out yeah. in television, Ra- radio soaps. Mm-hmm. To yeah, begin yeah, with. exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you did, you know me though. I just have to jump to Lost. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> um, and then you know um I, I do think like it gets it gets more complicated when we get to the mcu because it's like well like how much of this is frag and, and, and also i think brings up questions about like um older forms here how much of it can be fragmented how much has to be a part of a whole like what are these episodes or bits of a publication doing together because you know some of uh the serialized novels of the 19th century like the moonstone or little door have mysteries and character arcs that are tied together and some are more picaresque like the Pickwick mm-hmm. Papers where it's just guys I think someone described it as guys doing the a pub crawl with occasional breaks in debtor's prison um <laughs> you know uh, so 
I love that. Yeah. I credit to, I think, random person on Twitter um, <laughs> for the best description of that novel I've ever heard. Um, but, you, you know, so it's a it's a storytelling form, but like how much of like the story is affected by the form and like how is it how important is unification and is it more about plot or character and so on mm-hmm. and so forth. Um, so I, I, you know, and also yeah. our TV series novels, which I know is just going to oh, um, no. irritate. Yes, I, I think that's an interesting I question. Gonna you. <laughs> but yeah, before we move on the history, I think it's also important to like talk about part of the reason serialization, which I think like, yes, it has a very long history, but it's especially like I think it becomes much more central to the way we consume media in the 20th and 21st century. And part of that is an economic shift Mm -hmm. because as Hannah was talking about, like a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of how serialization emerges and becomes really like mainstream is essentially taking apart larger works and putting them in periodicals. Like, so for example, I come at this mostly from studying, um, sci-fi pulps in the early 20th century. And like a lot of, like, I didn't, you know, know this until I started digging into that. Most of H.G. Wells's novels mm-hmm. had n- were not published in the United States until they were published in Amazing Stories and other science fiction pulps. Mm-hmm. So H.G. Wells's first exposure, basically, other than imports, obviously, to North America was in pulp mm-hmm. works. And that largely that has, I think, two important interconnected impacts. One is it makes novels which and larger works, which can be very expensive just because printing and binding and all these other things are expensive. It makes them a little more accessible. And then the other part of it is through, through most of periodical history, we see that periodicals tend to reach a broader audience. So where novels, especially like long form novels, we typically see being consumed by a relatively small, educated, affluent class. This is, you know, not mm-hmm. always true, but you know, because things that, you know, Reading communities are not a monolith, um, but we tend to see l- larger form novels public, you know, read in those contexts. Periodicals, on the other hand, were an opportunity to basically make things cheaper, make things more accessible, because we also see around that t- time period that Hannah's talking about and also into the 20th, mm-hmm. 20th century, like populations of readers explode dramatically just because of a- increased mm-hmm. access to education. And so serialization, especially the economic aspects of it, all kind of like flow into this of making, I don't want to say necessarily like making literature more democratically accessible, although I think there's there's an aspect of that. There was such an explosion of the magazine mm-hmm. publishing industry mm-hmm. in, in the early part of the 20th century. And, you know, coming at it from the comics point of view, comics grew out of that you know, very specifically with some of the, the creators and the, and the publishers and the pulps. I, there's also mm-hmm. just the, the purely capitalistic point of view of you know, tune in next time. You know, mm-hmm. how do I sell the next issue of this? If Absolutely. we ser- if we serialize a novel, you yeah. have to come back to see what happened. You know, if, if you don't have an end, it increases the mm-hmm. likelihood that someone will buy the next issue or watch the next movie or tune into the next episode or whatever so yeah so there's that very practical capitalistic motivation for for the reason things are serialized and i mean i mean dickens definitely was aware of like the economics of his work and and you can and you can see that too in the original like serialized publications of like little door there are like ads yeah in the pages right like that. yeah like periodical periodical serialization allowed advertising revenue mm-hmm. It's also today where, um, you know, periodical uh, serialization is not as popular as it was mostly the entire history of periodicals. Um, usually when we say <laughs> until relatively recently, you know, usually we, you know, a lot of times when we say that in literary studies, we mean the last hundred years, you know, up until very recently, right. up until like 1900. When, when we're saying um, periodicals were more popular than novels up until recently, we mean like 20 years ago, like super yeah. recently, yeah. <laughs> like like post 2000, yeah. like. In this case, it, it is extremely well, and, and, until recent. Until the internet replaced the need for magazines, <laughs> right? Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, so yeah. it was. Yeah, it's yeah. literally like the last twenty years. It's super recently the, with comic book publication um, to where in the way that the industry has maintained existence, um, be it with the indies like you know Image Comic or anybody smaller than that, um, you know the stuff that Wayne and I have done on our own, all the way through the big you know Marvel and DC um, serialization dictates the story in a very real way, right? Like, you know mm-hmm. that like this block of story, if I'm writing a novel tradition, like a, a novel 
travel now. Um, if I'm writing, whether I'm writing Harry Potter or I'm writing or I'm writing, you know, um, uh, Margaret Atwood, any any modern novelist tends to go, all right, well, how long is this chapter? It's the logical length that I need this segment of the story to be. Maybe it's 10 pages, maybe it's 40 pages. And yeah, maybe I'll have a 10 page chapter followed by a 40 page chapter. It doesn't matter. Right. In the modern comic book, um, chapters are 22 pages long. They must be 22 pages long because that's how much a, that's how much a chapter is. And logical mm-hmm. storylines, uh, logical storylines are six to eight chapters long. So like that's that's how many pages you get. One hundred and uh, one hundred and thirty two is the average length of a comic book story because I need to make each chapter fit in one monthly book and I need to make every six books, six to eight books fit in a trade paperback because that is the publishing Mm -hmm. dictate and that is how it must work, you know, or else. So you end up with stories that sometimes if you don't have a person who's gifted it at, you know, at crafting them the right way, sometimes they might end abruptly or they might, you know, be Mm -hmm. paced weirdly in order to stop that. So um, there's a real skill of being the Marvel comics writer, you know, or even the independent yeah, comics fig- writer. Right. Yeah. Right. Figuring out the story beats in that, within yep. that, mm-hmm. that framework. Yeah. Like, it's a very structured yeah. approach to it. Wayne's favorite recent thing is Wicked and Divine. Right. And, and you can tell that there are how many trades are there? Are there six trades? Uh, nine, nine trades. Each, each, yeah. each, each is like six issues. And that's how long the story yeah. is. And it, and, it, yeah, no, and there no, are he, very he, clear he, logical breaks because it was creator owned. He talks in his blog, the, the creative aspect of that. There are issues that have more pages than others, but he talks very much about buying space for the artist. And since it was a creator own thing, if they needed two extra pages in an issue, they would do that. Mm-hmm. So it, it did very more, but yeah, Marvel DC very definitely. It's like these, you have 22 pages this month. I think it actually went down to 20 a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause you know, we need more ads. Mm-hmm. But- <laughs> But yeah, and and that's it. You create your own stuff, gives you a little bit more freedom in that that regard. And certainly, if you're just if you're Raina Telgemeier and you're just doing a graphic novel, it's however many pages it takes. Right, right. Which but is more like a novel. Typically, yeah. Is, yeah, and because that stuff's not serialized in the same way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and it does. Yeah. I mean, to that point, like it limits. It sometimes can limit the kinds of stories you can tell. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I I want to like sort of stay on this, but also kind of like reemphasize um, something that we sort of tar- started talking about earlier like uh i think sort of the way you phrased the definition of serialization um katia was you know it, it's uh it's a narrative broken up into parts which in some ways makes it sound like it's a whole thing uh sometimes it's pre-written um like i i'm going to cite one of our um colleagues from duke graduate school um anna gibson um who worked on serialization of the <laughs> novel uh, also I, also I, one of I, my I, colleagues <laughs> <laughs> oh right, that's right. It's um, obvious. Uh, just for for listeners, uh, and I'm going to leave this in just because it's clever. Anna Gibson um, went from Duke, where Katya and uh, and Hannah went to school, to Duquesne, where I went to school. So we oddly have both, all of us have worked with her in alternate um, situations. It was very weird. <laughs> she is, she is the mo- one of the most well-traveled scholars yeah, in the Vox podcast, yeah, she's, extended universe. Yeah, and, she, and she's <laughs> since left Duke, Duquesne. So she's at neither of those places now. So <laughs> it's very. Yeah, she went from Duke to, with I, a I, K I, to Duke with a Q. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then moved on. So, uh, so she, she wrote um, an article on Dickens and our mutual friend, um, which will be in the show notes. And in that she's talking, she talks about like the you know um, conflict between seriality and like wholeness and she talks about the different approaches to seriality um, in the 19th century and so there's um, authors like George Eliot that she shows like wanted to like write the whole thing or know where the whole like work of art was going before it was published and also I think that it's fair to say um, this is my editorializing that Eliot might have been a more um, artful writer than Dickens in terms of language um, um, she she was writing philosophy into her novels in a way that uh, Dickens wasn't interested in. I think it's fair to say. And Dickens just like sort of made stuff up as he went along. I, I mentioned he he literally like left one of his novels unfinished because he died as it was being published. Um, there's a Doctor Who episode that talks about this. Um, yeah, I, I've mentioned this on the show many times because I just want to know that ending. Um, <laughs> so you know, like there's like seriality, like there is like this incompleteness um, about po- potential incompleteness about it um sometimes it like there are rules uh like you and Wayne were talking about like it has to fit in this many parts uh tv is the same way well not exactly anymore but tv used to be very strict on network tv it's like you get this many episodes if that does well we'll renew you for this more episodes just to clarify when you say it's incomplete do you mean like each segment is an incomplete story that only becomes a whole in the large thing or 
is incomplete because it's being written at, like it's being written as it's being published. Or it's both. Incom- it can be both, but both or either. Both or either, but like I'm the, you, I, I'm thinking you meant like Drood, which is missing a p- yeah, yeah, like it, it, yeah. There's 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 incomplete in that like some stories are never complete. It's incomplete in the sense that people don't know where they're going necessarily or when they can finish things. Like uh, once again, to tell one of my favorite stories, Lost famously negotiated their end date because they did the tattoo episode, and ABC was like, yeah, okay, you should probably like figure your crap out. Um, <laughs> But you, you well, they know, tried like, to stop two years earlier. <laughs> or like, you know, Game of Thrones, like they didn't have. Well, they, they chose to ignore the good stories in front of them um, and also <laughs> didn't have like an end of the novels they were adapting. So you could just tell by the end that they were writing their mm-hmm. thoughts and it was painful for everyone involved, um, especially me and all of you listeners who have to hear me complain about it again. Um, <laughs> you know, like so like there there isn't always like a grand arc of where everything's going on the other hand hand it feels like the mcu is not complete in the sense that like they're gonna keep making these movies but like the studio has a very tight hold and an idea of like a grand plan um or you know george Eliot's like i'm gonna write this and not publish it till i know what i'm doing or it's done you know i'm I'm gonna postulate there's two different ways of doing things right so um you can have and i and i'm gonna make this you know very sweeping statement as in i am i'm going all the way till to you know Things like Kevin Feige in the MCU today, and I'm going to go sweep all the way back through Dickens's time or, or even before. Right. You can serialize a novel where you are intending to tell a complete cohesive story. Right. The reason Drew feels broken is because it's supposed to be a novel and he died in the middle of it. So it's just an inco- it's a literally incomplete story. It's clearly it's two acts of a three act structure and there's no act three because the person died without writing it down. There's nothing you can do about that. Right. So that's an incompleteness as opposed to what's happening with the MCU is that's a continuing story that may never be complete because it's not supposed to be like it's it's copying it's copying the model of Spider-Man right the intention of Amazing Mm -hmm. Spider-Man comics is that Spider-Man is supposed to go on forever and they change authors you know they change artists Mm -hmm. but the but it's it's never supposed to have a conclusion and so it's the lack of closure that that it drives me I I can't yeah I just I can't handle uh, it just it I I mean I guess this is like (laughs) do serialized and 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 Mavs you might say well this is why I'm trying to tell you Hannah no (laughs) do serialized uh, forms of media need to like have have a, a whole like uh, do they need to be whole and do they need to have an ending because like uh, some I, I feel like some well, people who know Dickens might say Hannah you know that not all of his endings are as good <laughs> as others but, you know like Definitely. when you get to the end of a Dickens novel he explains yes. stuff um, you, you can uh, I mean you can listen to that uh, protagonist podcast episode where I talk about Little Dort with <laughs> Joe um, and Joe's like this ending does not make sense and I'm like yeah I know it's complicated but like it, it is explained mm-hmm. you know like the Moonstone with Wilkie Collins is the first who done it novel and that is complete uh, a well, reviewer a for you. of his time I, I, described that novel as like a puzzle like you you can go through you can read it once and you're surprised and shocked and then you read it again and you see oh this is where this clue is coming from this is where this clue is coming from this is amazing he knew it all fit together can I ask you, know? you a question then um, Hannah but it's okay very, so like, to take yeah, the thing yes. that I know you I to, to take the thing, thing I know you don't like right Game of Thrones the television show not the books because they're not done yet but the not so Game of Thrones the television show has an ending it is an ending that you hate. It is an ending that things, some things don't make sense, but there is a decisive... None of it makes sense. Irrelevant. No, I don't Ir- make sense. Your okay, question just, was, good. does it have to have an end? There is an ending. You know where everybody... Like, the story of Jamie Lannister is over. The story of Tyrion Lannister is... Well, Why no, but well, no, it's that one up. that you specific... I, it's one I you specifically hate better. the ending to. Like, I'm picking him because, because I know you hate it, I know, but it's I know. an end. Like, he died. That's the end. That's how the story ends. So, so, like yeah. I think I don't so I don't think serialization needs needs to needs to have an indeed. I think it's often more fulfilling if it does, if it's well written. And I will agree with you that like the Game of Thrones ending might have been poorly done, but it's clearly an ending. I think there's also a question. There's a, there's a, there's a point of clarification to Hannah's question, because what do we mean by it needs to have an ending or it needs to be whole? Right. Like. Do we mean in order to be fulfilling? Do we mean in order to make sense? Do we mean in order for us to get value from it? Because Or to count as a serial. Right, because I yeah. think for many of those, like, so for example, like, okay, Firefly, like, which I think mm-hmm. also serialization in television is a little bit different, but, um, which we maybe we'll get to. 
Um, but like Firefly doesn't really end. I mean, I know they made Serenity, but it's still no. It's still open ended. <laughs> it's it's, it's Serenity, which has because mm-hmm. and but you know people love that show and get a lot of value from it. And so I don't think endings are necessarily important because I think I mean as human beings we like stories and we're really good at finding meaning from stories, even in complete ones. We'll often generate our own meanings when there are plot holes. I mean, hello fan fiction. Yeah. I, um, which is odd go to game of Thrones. I can tell you there is a lot of, uh, both like endings to George R. R. Martin's books because they're not mm-hmm. done or fix it for the show because let's face it, anything mm-hmm. is better. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's the sure. thing is I think in some ways, part of what is intriguing about reading serials is you get to imagine the gaps like in a way that because you can binge read a novel you can watch a movie in one sitting by its nature a serial is not meant to be consumed in one sitting and you know i I realize we're now in the era of netflix binging but in general like in some context it's literally like comic books for example it's not possible because the next bit hasn't been released yet to consume everything in one sitting so you have like it's not possible of, to read their list stuff, right? It's I mean, there's no person left on the planet who has read all of Batman. It's there. There is too much Batman for any. I, I mean, maybe, but I I can't imagine that there's any person alive who has read all ninety thousand installments of the Batman comic book at this point because that's that's literally how many appearances he's, he's had. It's uh, and it if is you an, somehow have it is an impossible task. Yeah, and if you so. somehow have, you should uh, leave us a five star rating <laughs> and let us know. Yeah. Uh, I think you get at um, an important point and like something that like is echoing like what Anna's like arguing in his article that we don't super get into and you get to but everyone should read it. Um, it's very engaging. Um, is that the serial form and something like the and, and like the novel form are not necessarily one in the same, even mm-hmm. though what we conceive of as the novel sometimes began as serialized fiction. Like I ask my students to read Little Dorrit within like a month and a half, which some of you might think is cruel um yes but but you know but people were reading that over a span of two years so it's it's I, in some ways i think like when we teach uh large novels in the classroom even if it's important for students to understand that form and see these big books it's really hard to replicate the reading patterns of life as the victorians knew it as they were coming out or like even tv shows mm-hmm. like when people are discovering Grey's Anatomy on Netflix now, they're not waiting every week. They're binging yeah, well, all and, like a million seasons. Well, well and well, reading in, pattern. In Ma- in, Mav and I have oh, said God. different times. You know, the the experience of reading Watchmen in graphic novel format now very is different. Complete, completely different than reading it in 1986 as it came out monthly and then significantly less than monthly. Uh, I binge that it, thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, like mm-hmm. the, the the book at the time, you, you read your 22 pages and then you waited a month or two. And <laughs> coming in every coming in every Wednesday going, is it here? Like, is it I here need, yet? I, I yeah. need to mm-hmm. know. <laughs> and, 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 re, and rereading, like every time a new issue came out, you had new information. I would go back and reread everything. Like I would read the entire series over every time a new issue came out because the new issue changed my perception well, of what had taken place before. And so I think by the time, why, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, by the time the 12th issue came out, I had reread the series at least 12 times. I think that's you know? closer to... Yeah. Um, and, right, that's and, closer yeah, to the that experience, experience that you're getting with not the you said the Netflix model, but more the model that you get on Disney Plus or HBO Max, where um where they'll release one yeah. episode of Watchmen a week, one episode of Loki a week, um and you. Mm-hmm. But yeah, mm-hmm. but I feel I feel like this yeah I feel like this is why Lost is for a lot of people where they talk about serialized fiction and TV in a very specific way because of the online fandom that mm-hmm. sprung yeah. up around yeah. Yeah, because I think, and this is kind of what I was getting at in the blog post about sort of more, not about serialization, but about the history of continuous and discontinuous reading, is that the way Mm -hmm. we read or the way we consume media matters for the experience. Like Hannah was saying, the experience, even if it's the same exact novel, the same exact words, the meaning and the experience of reading a novel over the course of two years is extremely different from reading it in a month and a half, even mm-hmm. if the actual content is identical. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I, I think that's important. And I, you were talking about mm-hmm. the, the te- changing technologies in the blog, which, you know, I, I, I kind of knew, but had really, you put it in a different context um, that I found fascinating. Just you know, the, the changing from mm-hmm. the way we read scrolls to the way we read page to page bound matter. Yeah. For, for folks um, who haven't read the blog and go read it, because I talked about it a little bit more in depth. Um, yeah. is that, and this blew my mind the first time that this was pointed out to me because it seemed very obvious once it was pointed out but i'd never thought about Mm -hmm. it and i'd never thought about the invention 
of the book yeah. as a technology before that point. So yeah. like, and when I'm talking right. about book, I mean like the literal, not like like novel. Not I mean the like, edge. Right. I literally mean stack of stack of pieces of paper bound along one edge, technically called a codex, although there's also some differences technically to what a codex is. But we'll call it a codex because saying book is, gets complicated. But basically, I was talking about the blog. Conte was not there. But the <laughs> way we originally when I say we, I mean humans as a species. Well, originally, but. Well, and, and I, I was not. I, I, mean, I, I, I mean, might have I been. Have a yeah. Maybe you're. Yeah. Maybe you're an eternal. I don't know. I I, I may have, have been there. Excuse I'm old me, enough. <laughs> uh, no. So when you're reading, one of our earlier reading technologies is the scroll. And when you're reading on a scroll, you basically have to go from the beginning to the end. And if you want to go back, you have to go mm-hmm. and literally scroll or roll through all of the 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 information between. That style of reading mm-hmm. where you can only read linearly in one direction or the other is called continuous reading. And that was an affo- like, you know, I talk on many of these episodes about the inf- affordances of a media technology. That is what that is the style of reading that that technology affords. And then with the emergence of the codex, again, stack of, you know, stack of pages <laughs> bound on one end, what most of us read on a daily basis. Uh, well, maybe mm-hmm. not daily, but, you know, you should. Um, that allows mm-hmm. discontinuous reading. Which is a fancy word for basically saying I can flip around in it. I can open, I can start on page one, but I can also go straight to page 50 and I can skip to the end if I want and skip a bunch of chapters in between. And what that does is it changes our relationship to the information. My history of literacy class called that random access, mm-hmm. which is like a computer. It allows random access reading. I can just, I, yes. in, mm-hmm. a, in a scroll, it is very hard to decide that I'm going to, um, I'm going to just read chapter 20 of something. It, it, just a hard thing to do. Yes. And, 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 and that's and, important because it, it, it makes mm-hmm. things like reference text possible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And in, in, in a metaphorical way, it's, it's one of the places where Alan Moore and Grant Morrison agree. I mean, that's the way, that's the way Dr. Manhattan used time. You, Morrison's talked about this. You lay out a comic, you can see the entire story at once. We step, we stand outside of that. We are at a higher mm-hmm. dimension than the two dimensional images on the page. We can step back and look at the entire story and jump from any image to any other image. Like we see the entirety of time at once. Months, which is different than just seeing mm-hmm. an image at mm-hmm. a time. That makes sense. Or did I just yeah, go way off? That's a very topic? cool way of putting that. Yeah. 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 And then so things like discontinuous reading, things like the invention of codices, uh, allow for other technologies to emerge. So like without a form of discontinuous reading, serialization doesn't really make sense. You're not gonna make well, you could, I guess, make a series of scrolls. We actually have historical evidence mm-hmm. that there were lots of series of scrolls. But you can't have the same kind of like random access and the sort of omniscient view that like Wayne's talking about in comics. Um, so basically what it does, like serialization changed our relationship, our relationship mm-hmm. to storytelling. And mm-hmm. it actually, I think, gets into a question that I've been thinking about as we've been talking specifically about Marvel. I know, Hannah, you didn't want to just talk about Marvel, but we're going to do it. I was actually um, going to go there if you weren't. So, well, because I like as I was preparing this episode, I was trying to think about what is a serial and what isn't a serial. Mm-hmm. And does that distinction matter? Because. For example, like is the Marvel Universe itself a serial or is it a collection of serialized stories? Yeah, I, and I would, maybe something else entirely. Yeah, and I, I, yeah. I just intuitively I vote for the second part of that. I mean, you, if you look at the publication, like, um, Amazing Spider-Man is the serial. Are we talking about, are we talking about publications yeah. about that Marvel Universe or are, you, are the movie? Um, I, mean, I, 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 I just think it's it it somewhat could different because I, I both think and par- par- partially with yeah, yeah both yeah. and I think with with the comics world, they're just there's so much more than there is with the movies and TV shows. So there's that mm-hmm. you know, amazing. Mm-hmm. Spider-Man is the serial, but it's part of this larger Marvel universe, which is a combination of serials of Fantastic Four and Doctor Strange and X-Men, and they cross over and they interact. And as time has gone by, that's gotten far, far more complex than, than it was when they were publishing eight, mm-hmm. eight titles a month or whatever. See our um, crossover episode. <laughs> yeah. But, but then in, in the movies, you know, like, yes, here, this is an Iron Man movie. And I think when they started, it was an Iron Man movie and it's a Thor movie, but now they're Marvel movies. So the, the definitely has changed it? somewhat mm-hmm. and if it's a serial if it's a serial if it's a, if, if the se- if the mcu is considered a serial which i think in some of their marketing marvel wants us to believe all of the mcu is a serial both like the tv shows and the movies mm-hmm. if only well, if they only want you to watch all of it, if only you all see, of yeah, it. yeah exactly if only for us to literally buy a ticket slash disney plus access for all these things um and, unless agents of shield then they're like kind of ambivalent about agents of shield also they just want you to forget 
forget about the Inhumans. Not the point. Anyway, um, <laughs> but, you know, like I, I kind of asked this on the blog, like, you know, you, you can't just jump into the Moonstone and understand it. Right. But people, I think this was like very evident WandaVision. People were like, I hear this is really good, but I didn't get into the Marvel Universe. And it just feels overwhelming because the first movie, like Iron Man came out when I was like in high school. And I don't want to say how long ago that was now. And like, you know, what, like, what can I, do I need to watch to be able to understand this? And and the answer is actually only very few things. And actually, uh, the more you watch WandaVision, the more you realize actually even fewer things than I originally thought because the mm-hmm. show tells you what you need to know. Kind of like right. the sequel Watchmen series, right? You don't need to watch or read the original Watchmen comic slash movie to understand the right. HBO series. So is the MCU like a serial in the way that like, you know, like, Lost or The Wire or I, any of these novels are? Yeah, like I'm, I'm inclined to agree with Wayne that it's a collection of serials because like the, the counter example I keep going to, it's like, well, if the entire Marvel Universe is itself a, a serial with, <laughs> you know, many baby serials within it then I kind of feel compelled to say that then fan fiction mm. is also included. Yeah. And I don't think that that's correct, which well, is I'm just, why... Yeah, right, I'm just thinking about think the MCU, though. Like, mm. I, and I'm not even sure the movies are serials because, like, I, I, it feels like Iron Man is a complete movie. Like, Iron Man specifically is a complete movie. And then, like, Iron Man 2 is a gigantic mess. It's a complete but story. Also, like, there's a... There's, yeah. Is all... Mm-hmm. It's also but a complete I think even story, you know. The movies, like, there's very the TV shows. I think are somewhat different, but I like, like for example, Wandavision. But the movies, yeah. there are very few Marvel movies you couldn't watch without having seen the other ones and then get something out of it. You might not understand everything, and some are some are you know better standalone. In theory, all of them others. except for the two Avengers, yeah. other than and Endgame and Infinity what... War, which are clearly one long movie. I don't, I don't think. Um, and uh, yeah, in fact, yes. and, and even those have definitive portions where you can where you can enjoy with that one without the other. I have a friend who who never saw in mm. who never saw Infinity War. And um, I remember her saying, oh, her, she she took her son to see Endgame. And I was like, oh, I didn't realize you'd seen any of the movies. She's like, well, I've seen the first Iron Man. And I was like, you went from Iron Man one to Endgame. And she's like, yeah. And I was like, well, <laughs> did you understand? And she was like, she was like, yeah, I really liked Why it. Not? I was like, How do you? But 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 again, she watched the beginning. Right. She, she know, watched the beginning. And she's like, OK, so some science fiction thing happened and half the world was dead. And then this is how they fix it. I got it. Like, I'm, she's like, I'm an intelligent person. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. up to speed. It's fine. I'm like, oh, OK, so that worked. And I always thought that was very, very weird when she told me about it. But but sure. Um, I Yeah. Well, because I think in some ways, Marvel wants it both ways. They right. both want. And, I, and mm. I think it's I think they've done well at it. They want the, mm-hmm. the economic benefits of a serial, oh. meaning that people feel compelled to watch or read all of the pieces. But they mm. also want it to be accessible, especially the movies. I don't know. I don't think the comics work in the same way, but especially the movies. Yeah. They want it to be accessible to people who have not been part of this universe because they want to bring new people right into i think they do buying stuff i think they do want the comics so yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put on i'm gonna put on my um i'm, I'm not victorian that hannah is but uh, you know i have an interest in um in pops that goes back and if i'm gonna be in to be fair i'm not victorian right because then but i'd I'm, be dead but but i'm not even <laughs> i'm not even yeah <laughs> fair enough um, that said, I've got an interest yeah. in pulps and there, and that extends to an interest I have in penny dreadfuls, which go back a little, a uh, little bit mm-hmm. as well. So, um, there's a penny, a series of penny dreadfuls called, um, the wild boy. For the listener, can you explain what a penny dreadful a is? Penny dreadful is essentially a, it's a, a pop magazine magazine that was published in, um, Britain throughout the 1800s. It's extremely cheap magazines that have serialized stories that, you know, much like, much like amazing stories but they're they cost a penny they're a penny dreadful um yeah it's basically <laughs> the early precursor to pulp and cheap and yeah. pulp is basically cheap periodicals because they're um, published in the yeah, 20, published on 20th pulp, century. pulp paper which is made of the cheapest wood so it is literally although fun piece of useless trivia amazing stories while it is very important to pulp history technically not a pulp because it wasn't a pulp paper it was not pulp. 
because it was not published on pulp paper. <laughs> it's a prestige, prestige Intentionally format. so. Yeah. Burns back was very into it had to be on high quality paper because he had this whole thing. Oh, uh, wow. Which I can't believe we haven't like, well, I know why we haven't because I would just fangirl yeah. over. I actually uh, didn't know that. Sci-fi pulps for an hour. Well, but no one. Um, well, very few people do. Yeah. The thing I learned while writing my master's research. They were, they were the train books. <laughs> they were like our, they were like airplane books, but for trains. Yes. And then you'd, yeah. and then you'd, pa- you know, and also they were, you know, they were relatively disposable. You'd read it and then you'd pass the chapter on to your little brother or to your kid or to your friend down the street. Mm-hmm. So like everybody was following them and there's no TV. It's 1860. Right. So from like, uh, so, so there's um one of the early ones is called the wild boys of London and the wild boys of London is um, a serialized pulp novel about um, it's, it's the adventures of a street, a bunch of street urchins um, uh, that is, that are running around in London and getting in trouble. And it's just like, you know, um, basically to take like to think of it from like a Dickens point of view, make a series about the artful Dodger and his friends. But it is unending. It gets published for like three or four years once a week. It moves from author to author because it doesn't it's not like it's written by Dickens. It's written by whoever they could find to find to write it. They pay them by the word. So it's like literally we'll pay you to write, you know, an Half eight page chapter, word, yeah. uh, an eight shape page chapter of it. It's exactly like comics today. There's no beginning, middle or end of the Wild Boys. Well, there's a beginning. There's no middle or end of Wild Boys of London. It just goes on for something like 300 chapters um, of just like the adventures of this street gang as people sort of move in and out of the gang. Um, there's always a there's always a cliffhanger to move to the next one to the next one. And, it you know, people die and then come back to life because, you know, intrigue. It very much reads like a modern soap opera or comic book. And it's it's clearly a serialized. They called it a novel. It says the serialized novel, The Wild Boys of London. It says that on the cover. But there is no, you know, it, it's just a series. It's just this unending thing where you're supposed to be excited by the adventures of these boys. And then there's like other to make it an extended universe. It becomes pos- it becomes popular enough that they start publishing the Wild Girls of London, right? And then there and I think there's like a couple of other cities where the, what, the Wild Boys of Sheffield or something you know, like they like I don't remember the other cities, but they're like trying <laughs> they're like trying to like build this you know early cinematic universe because like uh, 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 and you know some of them are authorized and some of them aren't. But because it's just so insanely popular for these four years in, in 1860s, in the 1860s, it's like 60 through 64, 64 through 68. I don't remember exactly when, but these are um, but these are the um, they're the proto tip. They're, they're the prototype of what becomes eventually the unending Marvel comic or DC comic. Right. Like it doesn't matter where Spider-Man goes long as he doesn't die. And if he dies, he better come back to life because we've got to print something next week, next month. And the entire point of Spider-Man is it's supposed to go on forever, keeping you on the edge of your seat. But since they're disposable literature, and in fact, it's really hard to find all of Wild Boys because it wasn't, you know, they were never at the time they were never bound together into one novel. You know, mm-hmm. they know they know that you're not going back and starting on issue one. Like Wild Boys of London is designed so that, you know, you turn like you turn old enough to like read and like you know we need you to be able to get on board and get up to speed with issue 22 or with issue 122 because that's where we are and there's no way to go back and read them all so it's like jumping into a soap opera right days of our lives started 50 years ago or more and you can't go back and watch them all so we need you to be able to start in 2021 we need you to be able to start in 2021 for spider-man and i think the mcu is trying to do that like i i i I think yeah um I think there are comic book pure, or you know, I should say MCU purists out there. People will tell you, well, if you're going to watch Loki or you're going to watch WandaVision, you need to start at the beginning, you know, and watch them all and watch them all in order. But it's quickly becoming impossible. And I think Kevin Feige knows this. And Kevin Feige would like to keep making billion dollar movies. So he needs to make sure they're all designed so that, you know, if you were born in 2000, because it starts in 2008, Iron Man starts in 2008. So it's 2021 now. It's been 13 years. <laughs> If you were born in 2010, he still wants you to watch your, you know, he still would like to sell you tickets, you know. So I think that's fine, right? It's got to be fine. Well, I mean, it, like, it has to be fine just from the economics of it. Mm-hmm. You need new people to watch it. Kind of also, I think the, the MCU question, I think, also relates to something else I've been thinking about. Is like, is most internet media serial? I mean, because I, I, I don't know if serialization transitions to the internet as neatly 
as it has to other mediums. I, I mean, because I think that, oh, sorry, go ahead. I like, you were well, done. I think about like okay, a, like a blog, for example. I I would maybe consider a serial. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe, but like, like actually, so the example I was thinking about was social media, mostly because we have an upcoming episode in social media. So tune in, and you know, next week, maybe the week after that, uh, who knows? Um, but I was thinking about, for example, Twitter. Like my, like if I look at my Twitter stream. It's a series of like little, you know, it's not narrative exactly, but it's a series of stupidity mostly um, <laughs> in order. You can look at it chronologically or however you want to do it. Mm-hmm. So like if you're on my page on Twitter and looking at my feed, it is kind of a serial because it's like, OK, here is my stream of consciousness about, you know, sandwiches. Sure. Um, <laughs> but if I look at my Twitter feed as like the few people I follow, it's lots of different people being interspersed based off of an algorithm. Yeah, okay. I, I think that's I don't think that no, they fall under a serial. But there are, there are serials on the Internet. In fact, I would say that serials mm-hmm. are where we're actually like you might say that the Victorian novels messiness lives on in well first of all uh, actually to go to your to answer a Twitter example David Mitchell among other writers were like what if I just like serialized the novel and like wrote it on Twitter and like tweets um, and I think that like not all tweets are necessarily serialized but those certainly were and then there there are threads um, sure. you purposely are you know tweeting more um, and then uh, to to go to the major example is like you know things like archive of our own where people publish literal novels Mm -hmm. in serialized form they have weekly update monthly update schedules etc like they're you know books like um well i i don't i always go to this example of course but you know 50 shades of gray started out as fan fiction so um it's you know like like they like people yeah like um the martian was released in serial mm-hmm. format um on a blog like i believe on, um yeah. yeah like a website like one yeah. at a time so like the, in some ways, I think the internet makes serialization possible, and depending on the uh, like wh- wh- place you're hosting it, actually, it's disconnected from like commercialization, well, sort of in a way that like the original like serialization, like popular 19th century novel, was not because like archive of our own is like you cannot post your like uh, I don't know I, I'm not like a fan big aficionado so my credibility is now shot but like you you know you can't like say pay me for what I'm publishing you don't like Mm -hmm. run ads I I think that's a distinction about the platform not about the form because I would actually say that the internet uses serialization for the exact same economic purposes as print I mean yeah but that's what I mean like it's a but on the platform you can't you can be disconnected in an in an interesting way even then you're still looking at like so I think also but the economic is I think different because it's like if you're thinking about it in terms of advertising then yes that's that's true but also the currency of the internet is your following and you can build a following through non-monetized like you know materials that aren't monetized but then the following becomes the thing that you monetize. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that, yeah, that, but, that's but certainly also, true of, of comics. Uh, the, the guy that I've talked about, John Allison, the giant days mm-hmm. started doing web comics in 97 or 98, mm-hmm. just putting it up on his own website. And he now has an Eisner for, for published work and whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Our local guy, Ed Pisker, you know, was making hip hop family tree available for free on boing boing.net. Yeah. For and yeah, years. And, 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 he, and then he went for, yeah. yeah, for years. And, through that, he built an audience. I mean, here it is for free. The entire thing was available. Anybody could go read it. And then, you know, when they when Fantagraphics finally published it in book form, it still became a New York Times bestselling book because that following bought the hard copy of it. So he monetized yeah. the the following he had, but he only well after putting the work out. But, right. but that, I mean, that's certainly true. And there are certainly people who like have followings and build followings and uh, like uh, end up publishing like their work um, after they publish this fan fiction or like advertise their original works on their fan fiction Mm -hmm. but there are also people who literally just like they don't even have a username that's popular they just use certain websites to publish as anonymous and they just oh yeah want mm-hmm. to get their work out there so it's yeah. it's but also even the like wanting to get your work out there is supported by serialization because mm, part of the drought, like part of well because part of the form of serialization is building a fo- like it, like serialization even in print is about building a following it's oh, about well, it, 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 building a following to your work and building a following of you as like a cult personality yeah like, yeah, but, I think, but, but, but that's what I'm saying is even though it's not building a following to you as a cult personality you're still building like if you if your only goal is to get your work out there, what I'm saying is you're still using serialization for the 
the same purpose, i.e. to build a following, you're just mm-hmm. doing it to a different end. Mm-hmm. But it's a different kind of following. But it's still a, my point is though, it's still a following. Like it's still using what question, then, is I, good for. I think you're both saying the same thing, but here's where, here's where I'm wondering, and this is where maybe the disconnect between Hannah and Katya is coming. What counts as serialization here, right? So here's, here's my example. Is Vox Popcast, is our show serialized? In the, and before you answer, here's the caveat. I have two podcasts. I have Vox Popcast and I have have gosh golly wow right gosh golly wow is looking at the different serial but it's it's it is analyzing um an episode at a time we go in through and we analyze the comic book series excalibur um so we have an episode we look, look at issue zero then we look at issue one then we look at issue two then we look at issue three if you're going to listen to that show it makes sense to listen to episode five before you listen to episode six because on episode six, we're going to refer to stuff we did on episode five, right? This show, Vox Popcast, this is episode 170 of Vox Popcast. And we might, we have referred to other shows, but it's more like the news. It doesn't really matter if you listen to all of our shows. It doesn't, the order doesn't matter all that much other than the fact that like, like when Hannah joined the show, there was a week that she wasn't there. And then all of a sudden that she was right but before Monica joined us, you know, like there's the old days before Monica, the old days before Hannah. But other than that, an in joke might show well, up and the order doesn't matter. Right. It's not there's yeah. no series to it's, our serialization. It's just it, that we're it, regular. It, it, it actually, it, the, the, que- the question is the same, I think, as if you ask is like um, in C- CIS, a serialized show, because there are <laughs> there's continuity between our yeah. show and. And also the NCIS episodes and that if you listen from episode one to whatever episode is when we in this thing, Mm -hmm. um, you're going to like hear about a little bit about our lives or the box office game or or the jokes that change over time. But like you can tune in, as you said, to any episode, just like NCIS, Mm -hmm. but it's the same series. So like, yeah, comics are getting at here. Yeah. Comics in the 40s. Yeah. Comics in the 40s were every issue was self-contained. There'd be multiple stories in the same issue. Mm -hmm. Right, they were completely self-contained. It had, or you read any issue of Superman or Batman, simply didn't matter. Now, okay, this is the second appearance of the Joker. If you read the other one, you recognize this character, but there was very little reference right. other than a first appearance. Stories, first appearances would often say first appearance, but like second, third, fourth appearance, the order is irrelevant. It's yeah, almost entirely right. And and I mm-hmm. uh, or or I see to look at a different and kind of comic changing like in the sixties, but yeah, well I'm. The you know, like even like like gag comic strips, right? Like like, is there an order to mm-hmm. the far side, or is there an well, order? And, I, I, and when I was thinking of that, just in terms of like yeah. comic strips, you had you know the Sunday stuff. Like Prince Valiant was an ongoing serialized story that appeared every Sunday. Um, Compare that things to like Buck Peanuts. Rogers and some of the you know, Mar- Mary Worth or whatever. Peanuts was self contained. However, you would have things. And I, I was just rereading some Pogo from the fifties. It's a daily gag strip, so mm-hmm. every day here's the joke. But they would get on a theme for a week week Mm -hmm. and this was true in nancy this is true in peanuts where there was a week they were playing baseball and peanuts right and did it matter the order you read them no but for six days there was a serial that was loosely tied together by whatever theme this week was pogo told long ongoing stories in day-to-day gag strips Um, well gasoline alley does this right gasoline alley runs for um i don't know i don't know for the listeners or even 70 70 years or whatever um for over 100 years it starts in 1918 so it's been a hundred and 103 years that it's been going now and it is a joke a day strip that also has a serialized um element to it so in it, real time in real time it is it, it is odd because there are characters who have there was a the guy who was the main character of gasoline alley was a child when it started and he dies an old man after like 90 years of publication and um yeah they like skis skis yeah. they they found him on the doorstep as right. a baby yeah and then he, and then and and he has children <laughs> he he marries he has children he has grandchildren and and goes throughout the entire series of the of the comic um, so there is a there is a ongoing serialization to his his life narrative, but the jokes don't matter from day to day. And while he's go while he's growing mm-hmm. throughout that world, the mailman hasn't aged today. The original mailman from that strip is still the mailman yeah, today. Yeah. <laughs> so like there, some characters age in real time. Some don't. So it's this weird, surreal universe where um, time both matters and doesn't. And can you pick up Gasoline Alley? Um, like you could 
you can buy your Sunday paper today and then start reading Gas- uh, uh, Gasoline Alley and you'll be fine. And you're not you don't need to go back and read the 1918 strips. It's it's fine. So I don't know. I don't know what ha- what what do you call that when you're when you're when you're calling it um a serial a serial narrative. It is serial in that like like you said we see Skeezix's his entire life in that in that in that comic strip. But like from you know, well not from his birth but to death right we see his entire life for 90 years real time and i don't know what to call that like is the is the nightly news serialized i mean i think what we're getting at is that there's a difference between something being serialized and something being episodic oh so, yeah 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 and like is that you can have ep- like because i think vo- like i would not describe vox podcast for example as a serial i would recite it like it, it is episodic in the sense that there are episodes mm-hmm. They are interconnected sometimes, other times they're, I mean, they're, inter- they're always interconnected in the sense that it's part of the same show with the same format and a, you know, rotating the cast of the same characters. Sure. Rotating but, cast of lo- lovable characters. <laughs> yeah. And, and so maybe it's like, this is, I mean, is it a serial or is it not? Is not so much like a yes or no. It's like a sliding scale of, is it just How? episodic media or is it a, you know, quote unquote, true serial? And there's a and it's a Does spectrum. It have crunchy marshmallows. You think there's well, you think there's yeah. a there's a spectrum yeah. of you know some and even on our show right like some episodes are more serialized than others. Um, for instance, um, right. we've done just I mean off the, off the top of my head, we did Bridgerton episode one and Bridgerton episode two. They're clearly a series, right? We did um, Copaganda episode one and Copaganda episode two. It would be weird to listen to the second one uh, of either of those without listening to the first because we are directly referring to stuff mm-hmm. that we talked about earlier. But on the other hand and or loosely speaking it's kind of like when we had the episode on on infinity war and the episode of on endgame a year apart you know they're referring to each other but you could listen to one without the other of either of those Mm -hmm. and like right now you know like i mean okay so last week on this show we talked about fast and furious does it really matter to today's conversation not really other than the fact that like i'm literally referring to it as as the past right now but it's not it's an episode not the serialization doesn't matter there at all. I don't think. Yeah, the, the second movie should just be forgotten by everyone. That's my <laughs> opinion on the Fast and Furious, and I'm gonna <laughs> see myself out now. Um, I, 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 if you have listened to every episode, you might recall I'd never seen the Fast and the Furious, and then Josh was like, "You should watch the first two. and I watched the second one. It was the first one. I was like, "Nah, I don't. I don't think I'm gonna Why, like these." And two? then I watched the second one. No, I start with one. Okay. I, I, and I said, "I don't think I'm gonna <laughs> like these." And then I watched the second one. I was like, "No, I definitely don't like these." films so and then uh, you make me sad you should i'm sorry yeah, uh, too, no, actually, actually i'm yeah. not <laughs> actually i'm not sorry i'm not sorry um no none of you were sorry about your dislike of dickens so i'm not sorry about <laughs> my dislike of dickens. 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 dickens i like dickens <laughs> yeah. no one has ever said that i would like dickens i would like dickens a whole lot more if they drove made. a kick-ass slander, car i say slander. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if dickens lived his life a quarter mile at a time if by dislike of dickens i mean your refusal to join me in reading one of his longer novels which honestly is very fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, that, yeah none of us are reading different. Little Dorrit. That's different. <laughs> that is. <laughs> And it's different than disliking Dickens. I like I, Great Expectations is one of my favorite books. I love it. <laughs> you, that, is, that is the yeah. one Dickens novel I cannot do. But everyone should watch the new Dev Patel, David Copperfield, and HBO Max. It's delightful. Um, <laughs> I will. I will. Uh, it oh, truly, oh, de- truly delightful. Okay, but there, yeah. that, that's a good wait, example, wait. though. Just before we before we end, Fast and Furious to refer to, refer, refer to what we did, what we talked about last week uh, of us. Only Katya and I were there, but um, Monica and I both made the point that Fast and Furious has a definitive split in their narrative, right? Like um, mm-hmm. the the tone of those films, and if you're a fan of the, of the franchise, you know this, the tone of those films changes drastically between film four, four and five. There's the old movie where it's about street racing for one, two, three, and four, and every movie since then has been about this international spy organization read by this immortal Superman named Vin Diesel slash Dominic Toretto, right? Like it is a very different series, um, but there is an overarching even though there's this massive tonal shift, there is an overarching series of narratives that happens in the, that is the life story of Dom Toretto that progresses 
from episode one of Fast and Furious to episode nine now, and he's you know he's missing from from uh, one of those movies. He's not in number two, right? Or he's two or three. He's in, he's missing from two of them, really. Um. So, but it's still it's still uh it's still in a serialized story that I think to Katya's point, there's um it, partly episodic. It's not as serialized as it's not as serialized as much of Dickens work, right? Where it is really just one story it is that, you know, if che- if paper were cheaper, would have been published in 300 straight pages rather than, you know, in 15 well, issues. Maybe not. Well, because, in Dickens' you know, case, because he, he might not have been. Yeah. And he wasn't um, done. Well, that's a man. If, if he was cheaper. But yeah, it is clearly one story in the way that Fast and Furious is nine stories that are interrelated. Um, closer closer to MCU but but I, I'd say it's I'd say the Fast and Furious movies are more serialized than um, the MCU movies where MCU if you want to just follow the Iron Man story you can skip Guardians of the Galaxy you know you'll get to Infinity War but you'll figure it out it's fine or like my friend did you can somehow watch Iron Man 1 and, and Endgame and pretend I mean, that it they're made not sense. complicated films <laughs> I, guess. I like them but they're 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 really I mean I, I mean so, some of them like the story is almost exactly the same. Like, sure, but she's I, only I, seen two. She's I, literally I, seen two of them. She's literally <laughs> seen the the beginning one, and then she sees the second movie where people she doesn't know. It starts with people she doesn't know turning to ash, and she's like, "Oh, this I is mean, a good movie." And I'm like, "What?" <laughs> 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 I never. I mean, it's you know, it's fine. Like, and I, I think it, it certainly helps uh, that the MCU just like leans on like all the narrative character tropes ever. Um, mm-hmm. So it's fine. It works out. Um, I can see that. Sure. I didn't personally do yeah. it because I'm I'm obsessed with watching all the movies uh, except the Hulk. Um, but really, you know, and Doctor Strange. I Doctor Strange is whatever. Anyway, not the point of this conversation. I guess I guess we've like run out of time. Um, I so we resolve nothing. Yeah. yeah actually, hey. well, what we need to resolve now is we need to do a second serialization episode because half the things we were supposed to talk about we didn't talk about. Well, and, and and that's thematically appropriate that we would do that. So yeah. yeah. It is the thing we do. It is the thing we do on the show. And, you know, if you've listened to the 169 previous installments, you know that you start at the beginning for some reason. (laughs) Did you say 169? Yes, this is this is episode 170. We've been doing the show for three years. I'm proud of it. (laughs) It is. We we have we have 30 episodes to come with something good for our 200th episode. (gasps) (laughs) <laughs> so, no you, pressure, so, right? so, so you're saying for the next 29 episodes everybody we're gonna phone it in but come back <laughs> <laughs> that's not true I, I i i i love our show i think we've got some <laughs> some good stuff coming up um we've got some really interesting topics coming up in the next few weeks too i mean um more you know and i'm sure we'll talk more about this but we've got some we've got like a show devoted to alcohol coming up we've got a show devoted to instagram coming up and two other topics that I know that we have that I've forgotten that are are we have calls for comments already. <laughs> King <laughs> Arthur. Well, no, we haven't King brought Arthur. that one up yet. Yeah, but but it, yeah, yeah, definitely check our check our website um, at www.voxpopcast.com for for other exciting things that you know that are coming up. You know, leave us comments because um, a lot of times people won't, and then I've heard people say, "Oh, I wish I," you know, people have asked me. It's like, well, you know, I would have loved to have been there for that conversation. I'm like, ask to be on the show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's how the best, yeah, the best way to do that is leave a comment, say something interesting, and say that you want to be on. Yeah, and, and that's, then, yeah, that, that's how we get guests. Yeah, and that, this yeah, is how the serial is shaped by audience reactions, which is something we have not mm-hmm. talked about. So yeah. tune in next time. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I feel like I feel like like some sort of the Batman music or something should play now. I don't know. Same bat time, same bat channel. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. Oh boy. Anna, where can people find you? <laughs> Here, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> last time I said, last time I said that I disappeared for like. <laughs> last time, I am last, nowhere. Last time you were on, last time you were on, we made a joke about like um, we, we were talking about a plot twist, and we made a joke that Katya, who was not on that episode, um, was going to you know the, she was the killer all along, and she was going to get one of us, and then Hannah disappeared for four weeks. <laughs> yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks. really appreciate that. Um, but you know, um, Hannah's alive. I just saw everybody knows they're both there. If anyone is going to turn out to be a murderer <laughs> of one of the other hosts, it's going to be Mav. It's 
<laughs> Mostly because you do the the editing for the show, and one of us will have screwed up something horrible and ruined your life, and then you will want to take vengeance. <laughs> if it were me, it's, <laughs> nev- like, it's know, never going to be me. I'm too obvious, and this I'm also a violent. I'm, I'm also the black guy. I no. die at the very beginning of the movie. <laughs> Let's. <laughs> 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 the trope. Come on. <laughs> um, Didn't yeah. <laughs> uh, oh Katya, what about you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram sometimes. Eventually, if I ever decide to post again, <laughs> at just that nerd kid. Also, technically Twitter. Also, if I ever decide to post again, we'll see. I don't actually believe in things anymore. Apparently, so <laughs> uh, you post a, you post yeah. to Instagram way more often than you post to Twitter. <laughs> I haven't posted posted anything on Instagram. I think for like a month. Uh, the odd story. And I haven't posted Instagram okay. in a year. Sorry. Both all of you uh, need to be you better. Can... <laughs> Do better. Yeah. I need to entertain me. We're, we're we're literally doing a show on social media like in a week. So I need you all to become superstars before then. <laughs> um, you all have to become influencers by next week so that like our so that our social media show makes sense. <laughs> Uh, Wayne, what about you? Uh, mostly here, but I, I do a daily photo on Instagram for the last, oh, I don't know, 15 months or so. Yeah, something like that. Well, over uh, a year. You've, you've uh, not missed one. Yeah. 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 I haven't missed a day since like the April before last. Um, I, I have a dearth of photos on my phone right now, so I need to get out and get some. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, I, I've been doing that. So it's, uh, T E T R O C 2012 on, on the Instagrams. <laughs> no. If you want to see my pretty pictures, that, that's where you go. I love how he said it in the plural as though he were one of the young hip kids that used to say things like that back in, two, <laughs> back in 2015, you know, <laughs> you, right, you mean, right, you mean the right. new gossip girl influencers who are taking Instagram by storm. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to mock that pilot relentlessly. Anyway, I have to go watch it now. Uh, you can follow it's me. It's really boring. <laughs> you can Sorry. follow me on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, all of the places, always at Chris Maverick. You can follow the show, all those same places, at Vox Popcast. You can follow the show's blog, like Hannah said, at www.voxpopcast.com, where you can find out what we're talking about next week. You can give us comments. Um, you can volunteer to be on the show. You can suggest topics. Um, a lot of fun stuff like that. We've got some really good ideas. If you enjoy the show, and we certainly hope you do, then please subscribe to us on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify or YouTube. And do us a favor, leave us a five-star review, especially on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or whatever they're calling it now. But leave us a five-star review that tweaks the algorithm, helps other people find the show, makes us more popular, lets it, it makes it easier for us to bring exciting topics like this to you. Also, like and subscribe on YouTube. Hit the L, which does something. Ring the bell. Yeah, <laughs> but it's something that's supposed to be important. I don't know. But again, helps us out and we'd really appreciate it. I would like to thank Maximilian of Thought Form Music for our epic theme song, building ever so more epically and playing us out. I'd like to thank you at home for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.